as Christians, we look around the world and we see a lot of things go on that can make us question our faith. And I think it's really important as Christians that we know certain things so that way we can actually stand firm in our faith. We often ask ourselves lots of questions about what we believe. One of those questions is, why does God care so much about being glorified? We're going to talk about that today on Exploring Reality. Quick update, some of you may notice a new logo and name that got involved with the intro. Uh, I recently actually just accepted a position with a ministry called Forerunners of America as their full-time apologist. I'm currently raising support for this position. And if you want to help, if you feel like God is calling you to be part of my support team, let me know and reach out. I'm almost halfway to my goal so far for a month for a monthly basis. With that, let's get to the point of the video. So, if you just tune in for the first time, this is the first video of the why series. So, the first why question we're going to ask and answer is why does God care so much about being glorified? Now, before I answer this question, I think it's important that we ask ourselves why we're asking this question. Everybody's different, but when it comes down to it, I think the reason why this concept bothers us is because of one of three options or maybe a combination of all three. One is that we just don't like it when other people do this. Um, two, it seems unloving. And three, it even seems to contradict scripture. Why don't we like it when people seek their own glory? Why does it offend us? And more so, why does it offend us when God does it? Why is it that we don't like people who show off their bodies and make us feel less than when they're in better shape? Why is it that we don't like it when people are all about how intellectual they are and they make me feel stupid? Why is it that we don't like it when rich people flaunt their wealth at us? We don't like this and it makes us feel bad, but why? So I'm going to give you guys an illustration here. I remember one of my old jobs, I used to get so annoyed by this one coworker of mine. I was in sales at the time, and every single time this guy made a, made a deal, closed a big deal, whatever it might be, and I'm sure if you're in sales, you can relate to this, but this guy would come up to all of us and the rest of the team and just flaunt. He would just be like, look at how good of a job, good, look at how good of a job I'm doing, um, that type of thing. On top of that, to add salt to the wound, he'd go running to his manager, and then the manager on top of that would look at him and be and go, why can't you guys do what he's doing? It really sucked. And quickly, I'm, I, we, I started realizing that this was just a common thing this guy kept on doing and doing and doing, and eventually our whole team ended up getting really resentful of him. Something about this bothered me, but what was it? I think it was the fact that the act of achievement itself wasn't enough for this person. He had to run to us and run to his manager to get something he needed, which was that praise. So Ayn Rand, a Russian-American philosopher, calls these people second-handers. These people called second-handers are the people who don't live for the joy of accomplishment of something. They live second-hand for the praise that comes from people. This is a trait that we don't admire from people, though. We admire people who have the confidence and composure to not need to live off of other people's praise. So we see the second-hander as trying to make up for some kind of deficiency or whatever by getting as many compliments as possible. So naturally, there's a lot of conflict here because Scripture tells us and our faith tells us that God doesn't lack anything. He doesn't need anything. So why does he need this glory from us? Another reason in my experience why we don't like it when people do this kind of stuff is because it just is plain unloving. This is a selfish act that people do when they bring themselves praise. It's not just that they're inauthentic or they're making up for a deficiency. They are, in fact, being selfish and unloving when they're doing these types of things. So back to my coworker scenario that I shared earlier. He didn't care at all about the team. He saw us struggling, and instead of coming by to pick us up and help us, because he's doing such a good job, he can obviously help us by teaching us something that we might be missing. Instead, all he did is point the finger to himself and not cared about how we felt or anything. 
when people seek to serve their own glory, we see it as selfish, which is a complete opposite trait of what you would expect somebody loving to give off. So, for example, when I'm talking to my wife, I want her to tell me about her day. I want her to feel heard. I want her to feel loved. And I value, I sincerely value everything she's telling me about her day, what she struggled with, what she did well, all these other things. Not only is that loving, but on the flip side, if all I did was talk about myself, tell her how great I am, start flexing in front of her or whatever it might be, not only is it unattractive, but it's also unloving because I'm just using her as a way to build myself up rather than letting go of myself and dying to myself in order for her to feel better. If all I did was brag about myself to her, she wouldn't feel loved. She would just get annoyed and tell me to shut up. Think about a time you were in a situation with a loved one and you didn't feel like this person actually loved you. All they did was talk about themselves and tell them, tell you how great they were. They were really cocky. Did you feel loved or did you just feel like this person only cared about themselves and only were just using you as a way to make themselves feel, feel better? This again causes a lot of conflict because scripture tells us and our faith tells us that God is love. The last point is that this seems to contradict scripture. If God wants to glorify himself and is selfish and needs something and is unloving, scripture tells us a lot of things contrary to that. When we look at second handers, for instance, we see them making up for something they lack. But we believe that God has no deficiencies. Romans 11.36 says, All things are from him and through him and to him. When we look at second handers and see that they're unloving and selfish, it causes a scriptural contradiction. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says, Love seeks not its own. So we see how all of these can cause some tension in our beliefs. Either God is not who we think he is, or we're looking at the situation the wrong way, and there's an explanation for this. God can't have deficiencies, he can't be unloving, and he can't contradict scripture, otherwise he's not God. So naturally, we have an impasse here. But this is where we get to the answer of the question. The question's better put as, what is God's motivation to be glorified. I would say the answer is that he is the epitome of good. He is the uncaused verse cause. He's the seed of all reality. He must first be for himself in order to be for us. And that seems like a contradiction, but hear me out. What else could there possibly be for us to enjoy? In all of reality, what could there possibly be that's better than the ultimate being himself, which is God? The answer is nothing. He, he is the undisputed prize himself, and it's not cocky or self-righteous or anything like that for him to say that because that's an objectively true statement. Think about it. God knows if we shift our attention and our love and our desires and our loyalty to the world, to sin, to ourselves, to other people even, it sets us up for death, destruction, disappointment, depression, all these other things. But if our eyes are on him and the object of our adoration is him, the ultimate good, what else is there other than hope and joy and love? So at a superficial glance, God seems to be really selfish and unloving and only cares about himself. But he's actually for us. In order for him to be for us, he needs to bring attention to himself and have us pay attention to him. Unlike my co-worker who brought attention to himself to glorify himself and only for his own pleasure and his own deficiencies, God is bringing our attention onto him because nothing measures to him. God is bringing our attention to him because he knows he is what will ultimately give us everlasting life. King David wrote in Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. King David knew this. King David in the Old Testament knew that God 
is the living water. He is what will quench the thirst of our souls. He is what will fill that void in our hearts and in our souls. He knows that God is the undisputed prize himself. God's motivation to bring glory to himself is not selfish, but it's actually selfless. It's, a, it's an act of giving rather than an act of taking. He knows that nothing will ever measure up to the fulfillment that comes from a deep relationship with him. If you're listening to this and you're a Christian, think about how much joy we get out of the beauty of Christ. Think about how we revere his character. We often forget that Jesus is God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. God conceived the whole plan of redemption in love to bring us back to him. Psalm 16.11 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is after us to give us what is best. Not prestige, not wealth, health, or anything that this life can actually offer us, but a full-blown vision and fellowship with him himself. So the answer to this question, the, the long story short, is that he is worthy of it. While he lacks for nothing and wants nothing, he still selflessly created us and still selflessly has us come to him for deep relation, despite knowing our sin. And he knows that having us focus on him will bring us what these psalms talk about. Fullness of joy and at a relationship with him that will quench the thirst of our souls. I know that's a shorter video, but that's the end. I mean, you can walk in this life knowing that there is a God who cares deeply for you. is calling out to you right now to repent of your sins and put your trust in Jesus to save you. Look at him and he is all you could ever need in your life. I hope this answered the question. This is the first question of the Y series. Let me know what you guys think. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.